Hi, this is Dave Belsky, founder of Flower Hire. Welcome to the Sunset Session. We're sitting here, unfortunately it's a marine layer behind us, probably because I'm interviewing somebody from the Bay Area who brought the fog down. Chris Lane, CMO from Airfield Supply Company, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, super excited to be here. Yeah. Well, I, it's always interesting to talk to marketers in this industry because I think there's been the most turnover at the CMO level of any executive I've type in this entire space. So yeah. good luck to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, they but, say the average CMO uh, lifespan is three years anyway. So we've got plenty of runway. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know, in cannabis, I don't know if I'm making a year, but, yeah, uh, but you're, you're gonna do great. Um, yeah. So tell me, Airfield Supply Company, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dispensary that gets a lot of retail foot traffic in the San Jose area, and, but, but prides itself on maintaining a, a boutique and like artisan and experiential vibe for its customers. What do you want to say about Airfield Supply Company? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, exactly as you said. It's uh, a large volume retail business, but our focus is, is honestly mostly on the, the consumer experience of that. Right, we see uh, you know pre-virus, obviously first COVID shout out. Take a hit every time we talk about COVID during this, but uh, all these just ripped by the end. Yeah. But uh, COVID, yeah, yeah, there it is. Uh, but you know we used to see you know as many as fifteen hundred people a day, if not more, um, back when it was you know just traditional. Uh, sort of foot traffic and lines and all those kind of things. And now, you know, actually we're, we're pretty much getting back to those numbers again, but uh, in an evolved way, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. But, um, you know, the, the intent from the beginning in the, in the CEO and founder, Mark Matlich, um, his vision from, from 10 years ago when he started it, where the first, the first dispensary to crack a decade in Silicon Valley, um, wow. was about understanding what people wanted. Um, you know, in the early days, that was, that was medical marijuana access in a uh, convenient, comfortable, quality environment. Um, you know, back in 2010, like the world was very different when it came to cannabis, it as was. we all know, right? Yeah. Uh, it, was not, it was not weird to have a super sketch shop and be like, ah, that's where I get my weed though. Yeah. You know, so, you know, his, his thinking from the very beginning was always about like, how do we make that quality experience, right? Um, and then as that scaled, uh, back then it was called South Bay Healing Center in the beginning and that scaled for, you know, five years. Um, I sort of started getting involved in the company when the, when the brand evolution came there. You know, regulations were changing, we knew adult use was on the way, it was still medical, but like we could see the world in front of us, uh, you know, it was brought in to help with, with that brand evolution. Um, what's the new name? What's the strategy? What's the experience? Awesome. And the first part of the brief, uh, you know, in my background, it was coming from creative industry, right? Uh, agencies, tech companies, um, you know, consumer tech and brand strategy and creative and all that stuff. Uh, I'll never forget, like Mark saying, you know, no green, no purple, no zigzaggy weed leaf, no green cross. Right. Like, like my intention in, in, in his desire, and I'm paraphrasing for him, uh, but you know, was that he wanted to build the next version of a consumer shopping experience that happened to sell cannabis, right? And it's, um, it's something never been done before. You know, just like you know, being a CMO in cannabis has never been done yeah, before. Yeah. And right, what do you, what does it look like when it's done well? And that's obviously the, the task at hand. And I think as a marketer. One of the more frustrating parts of this industry is is who are my customers and how do I get data? Because usually you're used to big tech companies funneling you reports on where your customers were, who they came from, and you can get really kind of creepy with the data underneath that if you really want to go there. Yeah. But what kind of data can you get as a cannabis retailer to help you inform your marketing strategy? Yeah, I mean that is uh, honestly when I when I joined and I joined about full time a year and a half ago. Um, from the passing, passing through from the consultant side of building the strategy, you know, the, uh, uh, the first conversation we had there, I feel like all I'm doing is talking about first, which is good. We'll talk about the future later. But like, yeah. uh, was, was sitting down and, and looking at like, what kind of access do we have? And, you know, obviously I, I knew the industry, but I was lifelong lover, uh, you know, since 21, clearly, um, of it and, and all those kind of things. But, you know, when you realize the like incredible amount of data that exists in a cannabis retail business, uh, it, it, it's actually like, it's, it's almost a shocking thing. Cause you have this, think every single person who walks into a dispensary in California uh, has to swipe a license, verify. Yep. That's more information than most retailers have um, when you're, before you make a purchase, anywhere else in the world. Like I can't think of another, I'm sure there's another industry, but I can't think of one that like, 
actually has uh, you know your your age, your name, your location, or at least like whatever locations on your license or passport or whatever. Which like you know for someone who was from Missouri growing up and then like moved to California and kept that license for a long fucking time because it's really inconvenient. Mm -hmm. ah, it's like you know it's decently good, but uh, but like all this stuff. And not to mention your, and then you layer onto it purchase history data that has to be um, securely stored, and all these things. Obviously, um, you know you can start to really quickly get into psychographic data because you know what they're purchasing. One of the amazing things about cannabis is it has so many different skews and applications. Mm -hmm. You know, from like flower, topical, edible, uh, you know, extract, like getting down into like personal wellness. You can you can start to build a, a psychographic profile like super quick. So like it was in, it, incredible to take that and say, okay, like how do we activate this? Like that was the, that was the, the first moment. And it was, listen, we can, we can do so much. So on the data side of things, you know, I, I think dispensaries are incredible uh, like experiences, but most of them aren't using that data. I've had so many conversations recently of people that are like, we know we have the data, but we don't know how to turn it on. Yeah, that was that was piece one for us when we looked at okay, how do we scale a brand and yeah. scale an organization? It was all about the data. It was all about how do we use it and how do we activate it. I'm a brand guy. Like I am a brand should be informed by data, yeah. but like yeah. it's a creative gut conversation. And I, I like first thing I did was come in and be like, let's do growth hacking and let's do acquisition and let's do all that stuff because honestly, like. You're just looking at an insane palette of paint to work with. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's great, and it's, it's amazing to put it that way because it's just about having the, the, the knowledge of how to apply that data which you get from all of your customers in terms of building appropriate loyalty and, and you know, targeted you know, promotions and, th and things like that. Yeah. It's there if you, know how to, if you know how to use it. It sounds like how important like, is building like a strategy around kind of house brands, not only for Airfield Supply Company, but in general for a cannabis retail business to be able to function and generate a profit. Yeah, I mean, obviously the, obviously, if you go ver, uh, vertically integrated, um, you know, you're gonna see a, a different margin that you're playing with there. So I think that that is super important for Airfield. It's been something that's really baked into the DNA far beyond um, simply just like looking at the, the profitability on it, right? Obviously there's, a, as you scale as a business, when you get to a point where we're doing the volume, we are like, we're gonna be looking at P&L and how do we optimize yeah. that and cost of goods and everything there. But, um, you know, from like an emotional perspective, almost to take it to like that level, uh, you know, this was about providing the best quality product to people at the best price that serve their needs. Like Airfield's mission from the very beginning um, from was the, always from the medical about, days. What? For even from the medical days. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it yeah. was from the medical days. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of people, and we have people who work in the company that have been there for ten years, wow. that have been there since the beginning. Wow. Literally, you know, the first, the first, first customers, you know, and on their side, they're coming in too still because we've, you know, we've built a world and a relationship together. But um, it was about serving patients, right? That's the way it was. It was talked about back then, and that's the belief that it was founded on, that this is a service for people. Um, so when you're looking at it at that level, it becomes intrinsic to your DNA. Now as you start to scale and you start to think about you know, creating a, a business that is, that is beyond a door, right? Um, what you're doing is now you have an asset that allows you to, to speak uniquely to people, um, that allows you to offer maximum value for quality, um, that allows you to, to really differentiate your experience against everyone else. Um, but you know, that's, that's not completely foreign in the world. You can look at other retailer industries, like you know Nordstrom. They have three, four, five house brand product lines. Right. Um, you know, you've got a, a, a name an industry, and they probably have something. Every, yeah. Everything. Uh, yeah. So, like for us, the the brand, uh, the product brand that exists is like a it's like a um, like a manifestation of our values in a way that we can offer it tangibly to a customer in that we focus on craft cultivation, small batch, high quality, sustainability is a huge piece for us packaging in the cannabis industry is a... Well, that's, you know, that's, a, yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's a hot button topic and obviously when you're talking about a brand that's struggling to turn a profit, a focus on sustainable packaging, it's like, it's hard, right? Yeah. Um, and and, and I, I heard that there's some really 
impressive things in the works from Airfield Supply Company about about specifically a focus on sustainability. Like, t tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that where it, it's really just beginning now. So I don't want to like uh, I don't want to leave the full tease out there. Sure. But we've been working across the industry. It, it was something we identified um, again, you know, from our, our CEO Mark Matlich, uh, who essentially said, you know, this is the, you know we're doing at Airfield. Say say there's uh, 1,500 people coming a day, and they've got an average basket size of whatever, you know, three, four things, um, depending on what it is, you know, in, in those days, you're putting out thousands and thousands of consumer packaged goods every single day into the world. Um, that is, that is a, you're either doing it right or you're doing it wrong. There is no question about it. That's yeah. landfill material, single use plastics, um, oh, yeah. waste materials, all these different things. And it was just, uh, it, you know, it, it wasn't a lightning bulb. It was like probably, probably like an I can't sleep at night moment. It was just like, this has to be better. Um, we are a world that was founded on, on uh, improving people's lives. And giving back to the earth. And, and giving back to the earth. I mean, the value of the earth. It is yeah. a plant. Yes. <laughs> like the, just... the core of this whole thing is a plant. Yeah. And like, it, you know, without the earth, like that plant's not growing. So... For us, it was really, you know, and we're just beginning this mission about saying, how do we do better? How do we figure out ways around single use plastic? Um, you know, there is a lot of regulation, child resistant containers, which are very important to have. Yeah. Uh, tamper evidence, right? Which is important to know for consumer confidence. Yeah. Um, all these things, they create challenges. Usually those challenges are easily solved by single use plastics. Stickers, yeah. labels, shrink wraps, buttons, all, all the different things that you get out there. So Yeah, because that's the risk yeah. if you as you go and build it and then all of a sudden this, the regs change. Yep. And it, and it's yeah. and you've sourced ten thousand units or yeah. more. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, based yeah. on the volume you guys are doing. Yeah. But um, you know, give me like an analogy of like what is it like to run marketing in a cannabis company? Oh my God. Uh, busy. <laughs> yeah. uh, an analogy. Um, you know it's interesting. I always think about it as like, uh, maybe this is just me as a visual person, but like the puppeteer where you don't know if the strings are going to break. Um, and I mean that in the sense of uh, you, you started the show, you're in, you know you're doing it, but you've got massive uh, regulatory expectations, whether it comes to just advertising rules and all those compliance, kind of things. Compliance everywhere. Compliance uh, all over the place. Uh, you've got massive limitations yeah. when it comes to uh, where you can, can't advertise, what can you, can you not say on the channels where you may or may not be allowed to do it in a way that may or may not be gray. Um, all those kind of things. Uh, you've got you know budgetary restrictions of working in, whether it's a product side or a retail side or anything. Yeah. I mean, you're not, you're not you know, these people are not taking, um, you know, in a lot of ways, there's not outside funding or you're working across a lot of that kind of stuff. So like you're working against uh, a budgetary consideration. Anyways, all that stuff. So like you got the puppet, you got all these different strings on any given day at any given moment, one of those strings can break, but like you got to finish the show. Um, so I think like there is this like very fascinating, uh, uh, like it, well, it, it, experience. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I'm I, sure I, there's like I'll a more elegant like, one. Like it's but, like you're, yeah. You're running and you're working with like a two hands uh, behind your back and on one foot, but yes. it, does, it doesn't seem to be that bad because you've because because it sounds like there are resources and there are tools if you know where to look for them and, it's, and it can actually be really really good if you can leverage the information you have. Yeah. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on brands and cannabis in California? I mean, when I when I first started doing this and California was was our primary focus in 2018, it was you know everyone's like build brands. The future brands are going to be. Global. Everyone's going to be a house of brands like Diageo. Right. Right. But like, it everyone like turns every to liquor. Right, Everybody right, turns to liquor. I know, I know vices, so, yeah. but uh, yeah. as opposed to you know wellness, but that's yeah. another thing. Um, yeah. It is definitely both and other things too. Um, yeah. I think but, that, by the way, is the analogy for uh, being a marketer in cannabis. It is that. It's that things. and other things too. Yeah, there it is. Is. Yeah. I got yeah. it. Yeah. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on like, like hundreds of vape brands more or less selling the same thing? Hundreds of pre-roll brands, like, is anyone getting brands right? Does anyone really understand who's buying and why they're buying? I, I personally think there are a, a ton of very good brands out there. Um, I think, frankly, like, there are a ton of very bad brands out there, too. Um, for me, one of the things that I, I think is most interesting to watch is um, the evolution of how cannabis brand strategy has evolved over time. Um, in parallel to legalization or, you know, whether that's medical legalization, adult use, um, you know, and like in where we are now, like, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about we're in, 
maybe we're in cannabis 2.0 now. Um, and I'll never forget, I mean, I, I, I was a sideline player and observer of a lot of things over the years with like this understanding. And I was working in creative agencies and tech companies and doing all this stuff. Um, being like, God, I want to work in this industry, but like, it's not ready for marketing. Like, it's just not ready for like, yeah. for big marketing, right? For, yeah. for holistic brand trading, because it, it was a product industry. So when it first got legalized, I feel like for so long, what happened was it was the product. And like, there's no better like personification of like that feeling than like the nug shot, right? Like that was essentially the brand, like, which is incredible because there's still an entire legacy world out there that just, that looking just at, like, looking at purple nugs, just and purple crystals. nugs, just dope nugs, you know, yeah. and like just trichome city and like just hitting it and like, and, and the, and the most loyal cannabis consumers that they look at it as a grocery that will always have yes. it. Some of them really like that. Yeah, pro, I, that. that's the, the produce but, industry operates that way really well. And yeah. that's good. Um, but then they tried to, and then it became, and then it became the package around the nug, right? Now it's kind of like this. 2.0 world, like I came in the tech industry, like I'm gonna be the asshole who uses like the 1.0 thing. But like, like the 2.0 thing, like I feel like is, is what we're like emerging out of now, which is this idea that we had, we had the element, right? And now we package it. And when we package, we have to package it in like the coolest fucking looking thing on earth. And the display, yeah. and the box has got to be sick. Merchandising and the has swag to be on the sick. walls, yeah. and the butt tender's got to have our watches and yes. shit. But what happened at that moment was people, all they focused on was like the shell and they forgot about where it came from, which cannabis, like as few other industries on earth is literally, the only reason it exists is because of the consumer, right? It had to be voted into existence on a legal level. Um, so it's like crazy to me, like as a brand person, whenever you develop a brand, the first thing you do is obsessive consumer research, right? Who is the customer? What do they care about? What do they believe in? What do they not like? How do they feel about this topic, that topic, all these things. Like that, that was done in parts, but when this sort of like 2.0 world came in, it just became, what's the coolest design? What's the coolest package? How do we make this look different? How do we do effect-based marketing? How do we do this? The biggest case study yeah. in trade marketing in the history of our world is the California cannabis industry. Yes. In terms of how much time and attention was put into that fucking box. Oh my God. Or that jar. Yeah, like it's I'll never, I'll never. It's, Hall of Flowers is beautiful. It's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, it's incredible, yeah. right? And it's like, I, I but it's the same shit and that one is, is yeah. that one. Tell me another industry where everyone has a world-class designer on staff Right? But they don't have an insights team. Does not exist. Does not exist in the world. We've placed, we've placed some. We've placed yeah, some good, insights and innovation people Thank in this you industry. for helping. But, it, but it's, it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's hard. It's, it's hard to you know, you know, pay for people and people have to take big pay cuts to work in this industry often. Yeah. And so so two, two questions. How has COVID you know, fundamentally <laughs> altered the, uh, the consumer experience? Like, are you doing a lot more delivery now? Is it a lot more scheduled pickups than it was before? Yeah, I, for us, we, at the beginning, we, thankfully, like, we've always been looking forward at that. That's been a huge piece for us. We've known that brick and mortar in store is a, is like, it's a solution for the cannabis problems of transaction, right? The easiest way to create a transaction is to create a box have people come into that box, make sure the box is compliant, make sure everyone in the box is compliant on the other side, right? Let it be done and then move it out. So I think a lot of the industry really just said, you know what? We're good with the box. Like I'm good. We're, we're moving volume through the box. We're doing the thing and that's great. And we, we love the box, right? We built a beautiful box on purpose. We built a beautiful box because we wanted to create an experiential It'll, endeavor, yeah. right? Um, and that, that's a big piece of it. But at the end of the day, everyone else on earth, it's like funny, you walk into a cannabis dispensary and you're just hanging out, um, but like you spend your time probably ordering uh, food to be delivered to your house on your phone, you're probably shopping on Amazon, you're doing all these things. I mean, it's, the rest it's of your novelty. life is modern, except it's, that. Yeah, so like yeah. for us, we're, we, we tried to move very early into e-commerce um, and into the delivery. And what COVID did was really just allow us to to, to pour gas on that, not like allow us. The, it's a, you had you to. Know. Yeah, you, we, you had, really we had, had to, to do it. You know, yeah. it's, there's nothing good that comes out of a global pandemic, but like, um, you know. No, 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 there's not. Yeah, the like, world is fucked up. Yeah, we and, take no. And what's it, crazy is cannabis yeah. has always been 
insane in terms of the volatility yeah. and like, are you, is it winning? Are you going out of business? We don't know. We're doing both at the same time. But COVID actually makes cannabis seem normal. Yes. Seem less crazy. And maybe it's the essential service and the fact that it's business is normal or the fact that like the world is so fucked up right now is cannabis being so odd and weird is like, yeah. You know, it seems really normal. Oh my god, I can't, bigger problems. Yeah, I can't much tell you bigger. How many like traditional, traditional people we've talked to, just in all sorts of industries, that are like, God, like old world, old yeah, world, old, old, old world, world, old world. I yeah. like that. This is this is the new world. This is new cannabis. world. Yeah, uh, that like they've come around to it now because of stress, because of anxiety, because of lack of sleep, all all the things. They've triggered conditions that have created kind of a thing. So, like for us, it's uh, it's. It's really just sort of modernizing the industry to bring it into better harmony with the rest of the world, um, which is such a stony thing yeah. to say. Well, I just want to create well. the harmony. But like for us, mm -hmm. delivery was huge. We scaled so again on, you know, on like the sustainability side of things. We we use Teslas for our delivery. Um, electricity is significantly better than fuel. Um, efficiency it also lines up to our brand aesthetic and all those kind of things. You know, we went from from four delivery cars to twelve. Um, over the course of COVID. And that's because we knew consumer adoption of delivery was going to scale massively. And we wanted to make sure we could support that brand experience in the right way. Like I, there's a lot of puns that come out of the, the airfield thing when it comes to, you know, like flight and all that, but like nobody likes a bumpy takeoff. Mm -hmm. It's like something we say a lot internally. And like, so how do you, how do you perfect that? Right, you need scale, demand, support. And your drivers all work for for Airfield. Yeah, of and, course. And, and, and yeah, so like, they're, they're, they're trained on the brand experience, continuity you, of experience. Yeah, right? right, again, brand. Most of the times in in marketing, no matter whether it's consumer packaged goods, tech, cannabis, usually there is the the disconnect between brand promises and product experiences. Whether that's a retail experience, whether that's purchasing from an online website whether that's, you know, whatever it is, a, a article of clothing that you ordered that shows up to you, marketing always has to do the Gretzky thing and always has to skate to where the puck is going. It can never, you cannot play to well, where it yeah, is. That's you your have, job. You have, to be, you have to be on the line. You can't yes. be over the line or you're yeah. fucked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you exactly. can't be behind or you're fucked. Yeah, you're a, you're you're a striker in soccer. You gotta be you're on a, the fucking yeah. line. You have to be exactly at Just the waiting it out, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so like, yeah. So you have to so that that like symbiotic relationship between the marketing the marketing promise and the brand experience is like crucial. So delivery is huge for that. E-commerce is huge for that. And then you have to evolve the business model to hit it. Like we always been saying, it's it's like a bit of an Amazon Prime moment for people in a different kind of way. And and I used to talk about this a lot in the tech world um, that like you know Prime and and it came from my days at Fiverr and the CEO there had this like massive belief on this, and it's I think completely true that Prime. Um, Prime was convenient, right? When it was when it was nice. When you signed up for it and offered these things. When Prime changed, that that hockey stick moment uh, came from one day delivery, free one day delivery, right? What you just did was you connected the expectation of ordering with the ability to have it immediately. And so for us, you know, we really wanted to reflect that in the consumer experience and say, how do we offer that exact same Prime promise? And COVID just sort of forced us to to. Just gas that thing yeah. harder yeah, and no. now that's the world we're living in and we're looking at uh you and know i'm sure it's crushing yeah delivery, yeah delivery. i mean it's it, delivery is skyrocketed i mean it's skyrocketed do you go how, like how far do you go do you go up, up the peninsula do you go up the east bay yeah i mean we go we cover pretty much right now all of the south bay we cover up the peninsula we go up the east bay we're continuing 408 to go 510 650 yeah all that you got all the codes down yeah, man even it, from I chicago live there, i live there for a few years yeah. i live, I live <laughs> in the bay like, area, so yeah i mean it's it's you know it's how do you take that experience and apply it to any sort of fulfillment method? Yeah. But how do you make those fulfillment methods unique and interesting? And, and how do you make people feel like, feel like their life is, is more enjoyable because they engaged in this service? Like that's always the goal when it yeah. comes to every time, every time cannabis gets delivered to me, I still giggle that it's actually happening and yeah. you know, it's okay. Yeah. You know, there's a cop right there. Yeah. Um, Last thing, this is more because I'm a talent agency and we marketers love the idea of cannabis because it's so much you can do with it. And, and um, you know, what is your advice to people with a marketing background, whether it's brand management, digital strategy, insights, social, you know, what is your advice for looking at this industry? And like, you should be, if you want to work here, you should be aware of these things and 
you know, and, and you know, how do you look at people from your old world that probably wouldn't like it here and why wouldn't they? Yeah. Um, I mean, first thing I'll say is like, get ready to get creative. <laughs> get ready to be involved in a lot of different stuff. Because uh, typically in an organization you're coming into, whether it's a, a very mature one, um, you know, to use like, again, old world terms, like say you're talking series D, you know, public world, oh. uh, which obviously isn't even like a phrase you can say in cannabis no. if you're touching product. Canadian? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, or, good luck on the market, but um, or you're looking It's bottom, it's no, going up. No, 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 it's gonna go up, it's gotta go up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or whether you're looking at like the younger people, like inevitably, I, I, cannabis is such an amazing, like to me it's so amazing. Um, like watching, watching something develop so fast and trying to see the infrastructure just even try to hold up. You know, like in most, in most companies, you know, by the time you're, you're getting your A round, like in a startup, you know, you know, you're investing that in headcount. By the time you're getting your B round, you're investing that in headcount. By the time you're getting your C round, you're starting to invest it. In, I mean, in, in, obviously B round, you're probably investing in, in marketing and those kind of things too. But, you know, then you're investing heavily in brand, you're putting your media spin, you're doing all those kind of things. In cannabis, like, because it is a completely new industry and a completely new thing that exists in a world that's already very mature, you're doing everything at the beginning. You could be a, you could be a, essentially a mom and pop shop, but if you're not looking at your digital strategy, potentially you're out of home for some reason is gigantic. I mean, I get it. I love out of home. I like can't, but Bates Tupperware can't parties. Remember. Yeah, exactly. Like to to uh, check out this tincture. Yeah, exactly. Which. You know, also works. That's the funny part. In some ways, it's like shooting fish in a barrel, and in some ways, it's like people are so curious about cannabis, whether it's the products, whether it's what they should do to serve serve their medical ailments, whether it's what it's like to work in the industry. Yeah, people are so curious. There's not a lot of information. So any source of information, like what we're doing now, and hopefully it's helpful for people and to understand, and helpful for marketers, helpful for other people in cannabis, and. You know, helpful to get the word out there on, on the amazing brand experience of Airfield Supply Company, right? But I appreciate you coming in during the parlance of our times and chatting with us. Yeah. Um, let's do a little elbow. Six feet. Elbow. Do the thing. All right. <laughs> have, have a great day. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs>